Your discretion is advised. It is a warm afternoon in the African bush. I am out on foot looking for animals and this is Safari Live. Ready? Standing by. and welcome to this your gentle Sunday afternoon live safari brought to you from a landscape that is turning from the verdant green of summer to the gentle gold of autumn and into winter. It is 28 degrees Celsius, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is James Hendry and I talk to you yet again from the tree. And I'm talking to you from the tree because, as you well know, we are doing a little bit of practice for next week's Mother's Day shows. Of course, this time next week will be the day that we celebrate our mothers. And Saturday, well, that'll be just a little bit of a build-up. Uh, hashtag Safari Live, of course, is how you get hold of us during the course of this show. That is on Twitter. If you don't know what Twitter is, uh, I would suggest that you find out as soon as possible. And then contact us, ask us any questions you'd like about anything that you're going to see here. Africa, Safari, anything you like indeed. There are three of us out in this particular wilderness. And Brent Leo Smith is swanning about in the north and East Africa in the great Masai Mara. Yes, that's what I said. You're going to have feeds from South Africa and East Africa during the course of today's show. Let us now head straight across to Taylor McCurdy, who was driving around, I suspect, looking for the two leopards of the royal family. Good afternoon, everybody. It is hot, hot, hot here in South Africa. My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Sebastian. And we are very, very excited to hopefully find some leopards, as James said. So we're looking hard, we're looking wide. We searched really hard this morning, and well, we're going to keep on searching until we find the two children from the royal family. And uh, hopefully, they'll put on a show for us. I think everybody is quite excited because we have not seen Hosanna and Shung in quite some time and we were all we we're always I suppose a little bit worried about the royal family so it's good to know it was good to see Shongile's tracks which was very very exciting and uh, if you have just joined us of course welcome again this is a live safari so this is happening right now and if you'd like to have a chat with any one of us even with Brent who is in Kenya you can hashtag safari live on Twitter and you can send questions through you can send us your favorite screenshots you can do all sorts of things or you can even send us today maybe we should do a competition screenshots of your favorite freeze frames of James hashtag safari live on Twitter and I think that might keep everybody in final control entertained as well as James in the tent because he has got uh, access to that. But it's not just uh, myself and James, of course, Brent is out, and well, the funny man Byron is ready to say good afternoon. Now, good afternoon, everyone. And we are sitting with what looks like a little threaded snake, I think. Tiny little, it looks almost like an earthworm, doesn't it? But it's I think it is part of the snake family. Tiny, tiny one. Little thread snake. Threaded snake, I think. And just moving along here. Yeah, very, very small. Let's have a look. Compared to my finger, how small that little snake is. Now, this is the first time I've seen a little one like this. So I'm not exactly sure which species it is. But I think it is just called a threaded snake. Sure, it's nice and warm. Sorry, jean -Dier. put a shadow over there. Well, that's a nice little start for us. My name is Byron, and on camera with me this afternoon is jean -Dier. And we're going to be out on bushwalk 
this afternoon looking for tiny little creatures like this and tracks and hopefully we're going to try and find Hosanna and Shungile who we think we had tracks of this morning again never sure which uh, leopards or leopard tracks we do see we can assume but it did look like two young leopards walking together so I think it's possibly those two um, there was a lot of activity last night with leopards we had young Hosanna on a kill um, for the last three days not far from camp and last night we a big male leopard not exactly sure who it was think possibly Tingana came into this area and chased that young male off the kill excuse me so um so those two leopards then disappeared we were unable to find them this morning but we've got tracks of them we're going to head into that area and see if we can find them so we'll try our best now taylor's out on the vehicle and she's got an antelope to show you you won't believe it just as we arrived at a treehouse dam thinking that Hosanna and Shongila were going to be lapping up some water we came across something else that's uh, quite impressive and that of course is this monstrous kudu bull he is beautiful and he is just sat at the most perfect spot too a little bit nervous at the edge of the water you saw him leap away from it something gave him a fright now he's not looking back towards us so I wonder if whatever gave him a fright maybe just maybe it was a bird that flew out of a bush it could have been anything really but he's listening he's particularly listening to whatever's going on behind him at the moment and that's one of the most amazing things with the kudus of course is that they've got those big ears which allows them to hear any little rustle of leaves perhaps a breaking of a branch in the very very far distance but any animal that comes down to a dam or a river or a little pan to have a drink needs to be on the cautious side because you never know what may be lurking in the long grass so I don't blame him when he does do a little leap like that sometimes it can take them you know maybe 15 to 20 minutes just to get a good drink of water we see it quite often with zebra very hesitant to come down to the water's edge always with the stallion in front leading up in front making sure to keep his herd safe and it's a little bit dangerous of course for this bull because he's on his own at the moment so he's got to watch over his own back but what a beautiful scene that is now every time I come around the corner to Treehouse Dam we all hope that we're going to get ma like magical sightings like the one we're looking at right now it's almost postcard perfect don't you think he is lovely now could you don't actually have to drink every single day can you believe it but on a hot day like today 82 degree Fahrenheit I think it's important that he comes down for some extra water <laughs> And Liz, thank you so much. It's a very funny comment uh, to start the afternoon off. You said, uh, is there any kind of antelope? Was there any time that an antelope is not nervous? You're quite right, Liz. There isn't. There's very, very few. And uh, we, we can't really blame them, can, can we? They're on the menu for so many different types of animals. <laughs> he even got a fright from the ox peckers. He is a little bit on the jumpy side this afternoon. Now, maybe he's already had an encounter with Hosanna and Shongile. You know what they're like. They like to lie in the long grass and give us fright. So I wouldn't be surprised if they tried their luck with a kudu. But again, he's on his own, so he will be a little bit more nervous. He hasn't got all the extra eyes and ears to keep an, well, an extra watch. But he's used to living in the thicket life. And I think living in the thicket life must be one of the toughest life because you don't have the open spaces to see around you. You've literally got to check behind every tree, every shrub, shrub to make sure that nothing is concealing itself. But our kudu has moved off. We're going to keep searching uh, for the two lovely leopards. I'm going to send you back across to James in his very shady tent. It might be shady, everybody, but I have to tell you, it's not very cool in here. I shall not complain, because 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees centigrade is not a bad temperature to be out here. Especially, it's going to cool down, and it's going to get dark rather early. Now, we're going to go straight to the microscope. There it is. Now, I know, especially for people like Judy H, this is going to be a frustrating segment, because you've told me what this is before, and I have failed to remember. It's just flowered again and I think it is absolutely st 
stunning. Sorry, we lost a feed there. We're okay. Absolutely stunning and just glorious example of a flower that has been designed to be pollinated by insects. And insects that will be attracted by the ultraviolet given off by those beautiful purple colours that you can see there. It's like a runway, a ramp. And then very cleverly, I mean astonishingly cleverly, just above that you can see where all the pollen is held. Those are the anthers and probably the, I suspect the stigma, which is the female part of the flower, is probably also there. And you can see as the insect dives into this plant to fetch nectar from the nectary, which is down in that hole that you can't, well, you can't sort of see beyond it. You can see how the anthers will either deposit pollen onto the insect's back or the stamen, or stigma, sorry, will take pollen off the insect's back and so the process of fertilization will happen. And I just think that is rather spectacular. Now, Byron Sarau has managed to find you something that you wouldn't normally expect to see during the day, but I guarantee you he's promised to find it for you at least 48 times on every single night drive he's ever taken. <laughs> James, I don't think so. My luck over the last few nights hasn't been that great, but we have managed to find a beautiful chameleon. Herbert spotted him, and um, he was hiding, in the, but he's obviously just gone a little bit high in the tree. Very difficult to see these little flap neck chameleons during the day. Well, well camouflaged and well hidden. But that is a lovely specimen. I hope you are able to see him, Jandre. Have we got a little bit of a shot of him there and that chameleon will most likely stay here he's been moving around during the day i assume looking for food and then most likely spend the night out on the tree hiding from potential predators <clears throat> and it is always so wonderful to see them during the day because they are very very difficult to spot we are lucky we occasionally spot them at night, but like I said, I haven't had too much luck in the last two or three evenings. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to move back out of this tree. <laughs> that is cool. Very nice. Nice to see a little flap neck chameleon. Um, so that's a good start. A little tiny thread snake, which we haven't seen before, and then the chameleon, flap neck chameleon, that's lovely. Now we are going to be heading, as I said, down into the area where I think we had, um, well, where Herbert and Taylor had tracks of these, those young leopards this morning. So hopefully we can have some luck around there and, and perhaps try to find them. Um, I'm trying to just scan across the clearing just in case we see some antelope. We know the wildebeest and the impala also enjoy these open areas. And it would also be wonderful if we could bump into some elephant. Now we did have a herd of elephant this morning off the drive. In that area where those tracks of the leopards headed to, I doubt they will still be around there. The elephant, as we know, cover huge distances, especially during the day, feeding and moving from one water hole to the another. It was really hot, and it is really hot today. It's about 26 or 28 degrees Celsius. It's about 82 degrees Fahrenheit, very, very warm. So I'm sure a lot of a lot of the uh, the animals will start moving towards water, but we'll go past some of those pans and just have a good look to see if we can find any activity around there. All right, now I'm going to try head down into that area quite quickly. Let's head to Taylor, who's driving around, and see what what she is searching for. We're chasing after a pair of red-billed hornbills at the moment. They've just landed in a silver cluster leaf up in front of us. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to roll in silently. And there they are. This little one, just up in there. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. There we go. There they are. There's two of them, and they're just sitting very quietly at the moment. I think there's one there. He's very camouflaged, as you can see, sitting in the shade of the tree. Ah, thank you very much, other little bird, for jumping into frame. That was quite nice and easy. See, this is what we call trained animals, when they understand English and do exactly what we would like them to. And this is quite a rare case with birds, because most of you know uh, how many times you are left with just uh, leaves dancing in the wind uh, when, when a link comes across to us, because, well, 
the hornbills have jumped out of the way. Now, I've actually, it's quite interesting. I've just seen this, these two uh, red-billed hornbills. And I also can hear some dwarf mongoose. Now, dwarf mongoose and hornbills have a really nice relationship together. We see a lot of different type of symbiosis going on in the bush. We just saw it very briefly with the big kudu bull and the oxpeckers that landed on its back. You all know, of course, the most common type of symbiosis out here in the bush where the oxpeckers benefit um, from the antelope species or any of the other animals by feasting on all the ticks and tick larvae and other little parasites that live on them. So they help clean, of course, uh, the antelope and they get food from it. Sometimes they can be a bit of a nuisance by keeping wounds open and so, sort of stimulating the blood to continue flowing because that's what they're eating. The hornbills don't do that. However, what the hornbills do is that you often see them with a colony. Of, uh, of dwarf mongoose and other dwarf mongoose are running around foraging for insects one may make an escape which uh, the hornbills could then snatch up but also what they do is that they provide safety so if a hornbill sees a predator another bird of prey or a snake or anything along those lines they're going to give an alarm call and that will then alert the dwarf mongoose now i'm going to see if i can find the dwarf mongoose they were just running they sort of ran onto the road looked and went ah, We've been spotted and then bolted down in that direction. Now let's see if we can find another one. And I think that's why the, these hornbills often hang around in this area. There's probably a colony. I've seen a colony of uh, dwarf mongoose around here. But now, of course, do you think we'll be able to find them? No. Nope. <laughs> but that's just animals for you. They all ran off in here somewhere. Now I'm not going to do the squeaky noise to try and get them to come out because I think I could be squeaking for ages. I actually don't know where they're living or which mound they're living in. There are endless possibilities out here in the long grass. Okay, I don't know. Let me just check this way. No, I don't see any little mongoose moving around in there. I think that they've given us the slip. That's fine, mongoose. It's okay, we will get rid of it. Ah, I see there's a spider web. I'm going to help you remove it. Well, actually, uh, ah, here it is. That cloth that you can see. Don't worry, it's just Sebastian. He's cleaning the lens at the moment. You're cleaning your eye. Can you see better now? Do you like some eye drops? Mm -hmm. You good? No? Okay. <laughs> we'll, get, we will get you a blue comelina to put a little, a little eye drop in. Now, where are these mongoose? Oh, I thought they'd maybe be under some of these little knob thorns hiding away from the harsh African sun but they have indeed given us the slip sort of like the pink panther just sneaking across stage without anybody really realizing that they were there I saw them though anyways you'll just have to take my word for it but there's some more hornbills that have just darted down into this long grass <laughs> John you said that you quite enjoy our squeaky noises for the mongooses I don't think I'm very good at doing it I think Jamie's good and uh, James Jess I think James is quite good too we've now gone from red billed hornbills and we've moved to the other common species they've just landed in um, again some well that one's not a silver cluster leaf but the other one was sitting in a silver cluster leaf but that is the southern yellow billed hornbill and there's a third one just about to join the party very gregarious both species are so it isn't uncommon to see so many together oh yes have a dust bath on the road that would be nice oh action <laughs> did you see that fighting over i think that could be termites or is it dung it's a termitan you see that little temporary structure that was most likely developed last night to help them sort of feed out of the sun of course ah oh, and just being demolished by that yellow billed hornbill termites are a very very important source of food there's also a cape glossy starling running around in the back and uh, well they're going to nibble them and eat as many as they can because it is quite difficult for a hornbill any really any birds to try and open up a part of a termite mound that is that is well not soft like this let me say this is new soil it hasn't baked in the sun yet so it hasn't hardened and that's what they look for even on the mounds is at night when the termites do sort of repair any temporary damage the next morning that's what these kinds of birds look for they look for those soft spots they take advantage of it and often there will be workers you know busy trying to reinforce it the couple of soldiers and that is what they are munching on at the moment oh delicious and isn't it just incredible the way that they sort of pick one up sort of bite down on it a little bit with their beaks get rid of all the soil and then that classic head toss and down goes the little termite 
very protective, this one, of course, over his mound. The others have been chased away and are now hiding in the distance. Yes, go and chase them. Woo! <laughs> and they are really funny to watch, uh, hornbills. You can actually sit for ages and ages watching them dust bath and they all get excited and they chase each other away from the sort of finest sand. And like you just experienced right there, no, you're not going to eat my termites. That was so cool. <laughs> so you just never know what sightings you're going to get out in the bush. And for me, if it can make me giggle, it's a good sighting. <laughs> now Lady Starfire, you said that to you the yellow-billed hornbills look so cranky and uh, I think they do too. They definitely are my favorite on the days and we'll take another look. There's one that's just landed up in this marula. My favorite time to look at a yellow-billed hornbill is on those very cold, miserable, rainy days. There's actually two that have just sitting quite nicely on the branch just underneath the tree. Well, there's, there's actually still three here. And uh, when they're all wet and, of course, trying to keep themselves nice and warm, and they're fluffed up and they've almost brought their entire heads into their into their bodies. That's my favorite time to see a yellow-billed hornbill. And I often try to do the challenge. It's actually harder than, than you think. It's to try and find as many of them as we can to screenshot but today, I think that they look quite happy. A little bit hot, of course. Their ma they, well, their beaks, not their mouths. Their beaks are agape, trying to keep the temperature down. It's a nice way to cool yourself off if you're a bird. And we're also having a little preen. Oh, lovely. Well, we're going to keep moving. I think we're going to start heading down towards Cheetah Plains now. I think James has got something beautiful, and I think it is a butterfly. Uh, no, no butterfly, nothing really very beautiful at all. Uh, what I've got is Ronald struggling because of Connor. That's what I've got. That is what Ronald's view is, everybody. And that's because Ronald is currently moving like a tank, which is what he is, of course, through the grass to the water. And that is because I'd love to blame Connor, but it's because I forgot to tell Connor to put him next to the water, so he put him next to the road and he's come out into the open. Can you feel the palpable relief of the fellow? There we go. He's just going to make his way down to the water's edge whereupon he will stop and look, hopefully, for some terrapins and there you can see him <laughs> there. That's quite useful to see how close he is to the water and with any luck he'll find some terrapins and perhaps one or two water monitors. That'll be quite fun, I think. There's just a slight delay on his control, so we have to be very careful that we don't drive him into the water. Look at him go! Isn't he amazing? <laughs> and he's got some lovely butterfly shots. You can just see a few butterflies flittering in and out of shot. And we'll just turn from here as soon as he's pushed over this what? No. Ooh, that's quite a challenge. Let's see if we can push that over and then we'll turn towards the water. Oh, he's very strong as our Wandled. Maybe not. Maybe not that strong. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll just turn him like that and let him sit by the water for a little while. There we go. There you go, Ronald. You just sit there nicely. And you see if something comes to say hello, and we'll try and find you a slightly better place to sit for the rest of the afternoon. Now, uh, yesterday afternoon, we had in this warthog skull a magnificent sighting of a von Sol's gecko. Yes, that's what I said, von Sol's gecko. And the von Sol's gecko was living inside the nasal cavity of what was a very fine warthog at one stage. And unfortunately, Mr. Von Sol seems to have absconded. Now, I suspect he may just be out hunting, and I'm hoping that Mr. Von Skoll is actually a Mrs. Von Skoll, and that maybe she'll come back to tend to her eggs. Not that geckos are particularly good at tending eggs, but uh, as I was saying yesterday, this, uh, and I've said this a few times about the animals in which, uh, or the skulls in which animals live, old, um, what did we call him yesterday? Walter? No, it wasn't. Was it Walter the Warthog? Walter the Warthog still making a contribution, of course, to the ecology of this area, which is very kind of him. I didn't introduce you to Fergus a little bit earlier. He's probably not going to show you his thumb because he's currently holding the focus wheel. He is on camera in the tent and indeed will be for the rest of the time. Good. Let's put this back in the shelf. And while we do that, I think Byron looks like he's about to have a swim.
So I am checking some of these little water holes around here at the moment because it is such a warm afternoon. I'm hoping that there has been some animal activity, animals coming down to drink. So I'm going to be looking for tracks, fresh tracks around here. We might even find buffalo or elephants trying to wallow or mud bathe in these little, in these little dams or pans rather. I did see one or two little butterflies flying around here. Now just as I look around I can see there's some antelope tracks around here. The size of these tracks, let me see if I can find a clear one. Have a look at this one. Uh, oh. There we go. There's a nice little track over here. This looks like it's possibly kudu that have walked through here. Um, now the mud does expand the track slightly, but judging by the size and where it is, I think this is possibly kudu that have come down and had a little drink here. Um, there are also little bird tracks. Now this little bird track over here, that looks like a lap wing of sorts, possibly across the across the mud maybe a maybe one of the lap wings or even a thick knee perhaps one of the thick knees that have been moving around these areas in the evening looking for insects looking for food so i think it might actually be a thick knee a water thick knee looking for food around here now i don't see any fresh activity around this little dam or this little water hole mud wallow rather and um, this is definitely a, just a mud wallow. You can see it doesn't look like it's been disturbed. Signs that you can look for are... Now you can, you would be able to see water splashed up on the sides or fresh wet soil. Nothing of that around here. So this little mud wallow hasn't been used um, very recently. Ali, you asked about the birds in the area and you wanted to know, are there hummingbirds found here? No, we do not have hum hummingbirds in Africa. So we don't see them. Um, <clears throat> now uh, we, get, we get little birds called the bee eaters, I suppose, which look almost like honey, um, hummingbirds, but, um, but much larger. They, um, they also have slightly pointed beaks, but not, not really anything like that. I'm trying to think of a little bird that would look similar to uh, the sunbirds. The sunbirds um, look like hummingbirds, tiny little sunbirds, very sharp pointed curved beaks, but they don't hover like the hummingbirds do. They will fly slightly fall around little flowers and get nectar in, but they can't actually hover as well as those little hummingbirds. So we don't have hummingbirds here. Okay, let's head back to Taylor, who's still driving around and see how her search this afternoon is going. You won't believe it, we're having the most hilarious afternoon today. The animals are definitely putting on a show for us. These are two lovely little warthogs and there is a big boar that's about to come back and join them. There he is. And it's my favorite warthog in the whole wide world. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, how on earth do you know which warthog is this? This is our dear friend. <laughs> <laughs> He's, <awesome. laughs> He's so cool. Who lives in Gwen's burrow. And the reason how I know it's him is because he's got quite big tusks and he's also missing the tip of hair to, uh, the tip of the hair to his tail and we see him here almost every single day and he is my absolute favorite he ran off because he chased another big boar that was trying to come and steal his pan and perhaps his ladies too he was not standing for that you can see he's quite riled up at the moment he's got his mane all up he's got his cup he's covered in mud he's ready to go out and he's got his girls joining him at the spa this afternoon yes this is fantastic. So as you see, of course, not only do the buffalo, the rhinos, the warthog, well, of course, the warthogs, as all the different animals like to have mud, mud baths, but a warthog, I think, must be one of the funniest characters in the whole wide world to watch them roll around. Now, they've got a bit nervous, and I think that's just because you must remember, uh, we were just on Gowrie, Maine, just a moment ago, and there's lots of big tracks trucks bringing in diesel, trucks bringing in food and they go up and down these roads and you, the animals can get a little bit used to it but sometimes unfortunately you're still a little bit nervous but that was cool I'm glad we got a quick view of my favorite little pig having a little bath around but we're going to send you all the way now to Kenya Well, at least you can see some of the warthog and, and the sabi sands out here at the moment. Oh, oh excitement. 
Um, the, water, the grass is too long. We can just see tails. But please don't fly. Please don't fly. Get your bird list ready. By the way, my name is Brett Yo Smith. We're on a live African safari in the Maasai Mara. I have uh, the talented Zander on. No! Come back, grey-backed fiscal. Oh, there's two of them. Is that okay here, Zander? Yeah. Oh, and some babblers by the looks of things. Have we got the on the far right? Yeah. right. So there we go. That's a really cool bird. It's a grey backed fiscal shrike. And that's another one from Mara List. Let me just get my binoculars out because it looks like there's a few other birds in the tree. Now we've uh, we haven't seen much yet this afternoon, but we've we've gone into an area that we haven't been before and the grass is very long. And uh, there's a couple of prides of lions around there, one that's called the the uh, sausage tree pride. But I think with the long grass, unless they're actually up in the tree, we're not going to get any luck. But we are heading towards the report of the Serena Pride of Lions on a giraffe kill. So we're going to try head down towards there. And then this is very exciting. So literally, this is the first time I've ever been here. You're experiencing this live for the first time with me. Hashtag Safari Live. Uh, if you want to ask us any questions. Remember, on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. It is absolutely exquisite out here. Oh, here comes the puff back. He's land, landed, landed right next to us. Look, 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 look. Now, Ali's wondering, are there dwarf mongoose in Kenya? Uh, we do get dwarf mongoose here. They're slightly different coloration. They're, they're sort of orangey, but rusty. There we go. Thanks very much, Doug. Now, rusty are colored. We also uh, have been seeing a lot of banded mongoose, so I will be keeping my eye out for both of those. But with the grass at the length, it is at the moment it can make spotting those difficult how cool is this now this is a new bird tick for all of us the gray backed fiscal i'm hunting around now the fiscal shrikes are, are quite famous and uh, they're old really old name what my grandfather used to call them was a jackie hangman now of course jackie hangman was the, the man who used to pull the the rope and send people to their death now when they catch insects uh, they like to store them on thorns and uh, and they keep a little larder like that so sometimes it can be quite macabre and uh, that tree it flew out of is a balanites but a different balanites to the one we used to and the but it's balanites egypt egypt Egyptica. There we go. Thanks, Douglas. Egyptica. So uh, the one we have is Morgami in 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 southern Africa. Now this is a very very important area. So the the Mara has these balanite zones that are a little bit higher, uh, and they don't get as flooded during the rains. But we're going to keep moving towards the hopefully a pride of lions that are munching upon uh, a, a poor giraffe. Uh, not so good for the giraffe, but good for the lions. But James has got something on his damn cam. I do, but I must just say that, you know, you can point the camera anywhere you like uh, on that vehicle and there's just spectacularness everywhere you look. It is just wonderfully stunning to be there in the Mara and, of course, to be taking you there with us. Now, let us go to the dam cam, where we have got nothing. Wonderful. Okay. Well, apparently there was a water monitor there. Uh, I'm not sure who's controlling the camera this afternoon. Um, right. Zoomy, if we could find your water monitor, you did such a great job of finding it. Unfortunately, Ronald has become crippled for some reason. There it is. There it is. Thank you, Zoomy. A little bit to the left and we'll be on the money. That is, of course, Africa's very largest lizard, if you exclude... Uh, the crocodile, which isn't strictly speaking a lizard, but that I think is probably, as Byron was saying to you the other day, the biggest water monitor that we've ever seen. They can go to up to two and a half meters in length, which is quite something, and this one and it, I'm pretty sure it can only be this one because both Herbert and Byron and I have confused its tracks for those of a crocodile. It moves between Twin Dams and Juma Dam. So this is Juma Dam and that is a distance of some, ooh, I don't know, about five kilometers probably. Maybe just under that, maybe four kilometers. So about three miles, two and a half to three miles. 
So that is quite a distance to move, and its tracks go up and down the road. It's also made itself a very nice friend there, a terrapin, who is almost looks like it's trying to display its size by sticky poking its head out as high up as it'll go. Now, I mean, a rock mo a monitor lizard like that will pretty much eat anything that it can catch, but apparently, perhaps the stink of a terrapin uh, discourages the monitor from getting hold of it. And in fact, it's all surrounded by terrapins. Look at them, they're all over the place there. And I'm amazed, because they will literally eat anything that they can. And Liz, you thought it was a log. Well, Liz, I don't blame you, and I think it's designed to look precisely like a log. I think that's the whole reason for its golden, well, what looks to us to be sort of golden and dark colours, but if it lies on a log, which they often do, Yes, they're very difficult to see indeed, but this chap is enormous. I mean, he really is big. He's got to be two and a half metres or certainly two metres long, so over six feet, six foot eight odd, or six foot five odd. Yeah, now, Sita, you're wondering if a bite could hurt you. They do bite, and uh, I remember a wonderful sighting that Taylor had of Guchava, the little leopard, um, on, where was she? She was on Cheetah Plains, and she set about trying to catch one of these water monitors, and the water monitor frightened her off eventually, and they will bite, but the greatest defense they have is that slashing tail they have. They use it like a rapier, and they can, well, I mean, if they hit you hard enough, it's certainly sharp enough to leave a small cut, but it will also hurt. They can really slash with it, and it can do some serious damage to faces, especially on something like a leopard, if a leopard would try to catch this monitor on the back of its neck which of course is exactly what Shongile did a little while back, but nothing quite like this size. Byron has managed to find himself and us on foot. Shh, so be very quiet. And then... I have indeed, everyone, and I could actually smell this elephant before I saw him. It looks like a big bull. I'm just listening out to make sure there aren't any others around. But this bull is in must, and that's what I could smell. So he's got a very strong musty scent to him. And you can see he's actually sweating from his temporal glands, much like I am at the moment. <laughs> it's very, very warm. But we actually we're in a perfect position. Um, I don't think he knows that we are here yet. He's happily feeding. See him flapping his ears very slowly, cooling himself down. Those ears have a lot of veins in them. So by flapping the ears, he cools the blood down in his ears. And that then circulates through the body, slowly but surely cooling down the te body temperature. Not by much, but it does help a, a few degrees. Such a lovely, lovely experience viewing these big elephant bulls on foot. I just want to have a look around here quickly. Let's see if we've got another view of him. I'm just trying to have a look, like I said, just to see if there aren't any others around, which there very may well be. But this looks like it's just a big lone bull, which often happens, you do get to see these bulls by themselves. Whew, sure, I can smell him. So the wind is, the wind is in our favour at the moment. And what I say, what I mean by in our favour, is the wind is blowing from him towards us. So that helps us because we can smell him, he can't smell us. So that again just shows that he doesn't know we are here yet. I'm keeping my voice very low, not making too much noise. The best thing to do on foot is if you can view an animal like this and then leave without it knowing you were there. I wonder, let's just come over here a little bit, Andre, follow me. We've still got a lot of cover here, which is perfect for us. Our plan of 
going to these little water holes, mud wallows paid off. There we can see this elephant, he's not far from the water hole. George, an elephant's eyesight is actually very good. It's, um, they can definitely see us from a few hundred meters away. I'm just listening at the moment, just watching. If we're lucky, maybe we get this elephant going and bathing a little bit, splashing himself with water. What I'm going to do is just try and have a look. I think if we just move back, Chandra, a little bit, just straight back through there. And um, all that we're doing is we're getting a bit more cover. That's all. Just watch out the aerial. <laughs> Come through here. There we go. So we can stand here now. We've got some cover. We don't have to worry. Now what I'm hoping is if we stand very very still and quietly that elephant comes down to drink. See what he decides to do. You can just see the legs through there, through the trees. This is such a wonderful experience. As I was saying, a bushwalk gives you a completely different perspective of viewing these animals when you are on foot and you're able to get a little bit closer. Again, we do have to be respectful, we do have to be careful, but there's no reason for this elephant to be th threatened. We've kept our distance now, we've in a thicket, we've got some cover, so that elephant should, and it actually looks like he's leaning to one side, which is a good sign, it means he's resting, completely relaxed. Zane, now you asked if I can describe this musty smell. I actually don't know how to describe it. It's a very strong musty smell, very pungent. Um, I'm just trying to think the best way to describe it. Um, yeah. James is usually a bit better at describing these smells than what I am. Um, So, Jandre described it as sweet leather, and VM once described it as off oros. So, what we've learned from this is that is that cameraman can't smell anything. There we go. Just as we thought, he's come out from behind the bushes. Oh yes, he's going to probably splash himself and have a drink. This is amazing. You could hear him spraying the water into his into his mouth. Usually what they do is they lift their trunks and they tip the water into the mouth, allow gravity to do the work. Now with him drinking like this, it's also a good sign that he's quite comfortable. He wouldn't have come to drink if he had known we were here and if he felt in any way threatened. Now we have got, I know this area, we have got a few termite mounds behind us. If we do need to move out we know exactly where to go. But there's absolutely no danger, no threat at the moment. Really a wonderful, wonderful sighting. And he's not too far from us, as you can see. Uh, Caroline, and the lifespan of an elephant and possibly of a big bull like this might be about 50 to 60 years old. So it's a long lifespan for these massive animals. Now he doesn't look like a really old bull. I still think he's got a number of years to grow. Um, it's hard to tell, but he looked like he's possibly around around 30 years old or so, I would say. I would guess, somewhere around there. So he's still got some time to grow. You can hear what he's doing now. Is he's busy feeding on all that green vegetation around this water hole. Yeah, you can see. Actually, from the... Yeah, if you have a look... Jandre might have been focused on um, on his penis between the back legs. 
you can see the must the all that liquid um, it's not the must it's the liquid that is excreted from the penis um, a lot of testosterone moving through the body when they are in must that causes them to sweat from the temporal glands and secrete a liquid from the penis and that is that pungent smell that we can smell at the moment very very strong smell what I think we're going to do is um, later when we go back to James in the tent we'll ask him to maybe describe it he's a little bit better at describing these smells but it, it smells like a I want to say almost an off blue cheese or camembert smell perhaps <laughs> definitely <laughs> mixed with sweet leather and off iris <laughs> I don't know if that elephant will be too happy about us describing it like that. Hey, is having another drink? Oh, it's a lovely sound, isn't that amazing? It's because he's so close to us, very, very close to us. really is amazing to hear these sounds so close Good afternoon, yes, on, <laughs> so oh, one of the other guides just got mobile and blaring over the radio but that's that's our fault we should always make sure the radios are turned down when you do get to sightings like this see where that elephant goes now. Okay, we're going to stand dead still here for a second because he's he's just moving. Okay, I'm just going to see which direction he goes to. We're going to stand dead still for a second and keep quiet. Let's head back to James in the tent and see if he can describe the smell of must. Uh. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful sighting, and I also think that uh, sweet leather was mine, so jean Ray is not going to take and claim that one at all. And I'm going to add to the smell of sign of sweet leather, there is the addition of dried apricots and honey being left in the sun for a long time with the addition of some ethyl alcohol mixed in. And I think that's basically quite a nice description of... Um, of must, although I must tell you that Viam's off Oros, so Oros of course is a is an orange squash that we get out here. It's basically a legalized poison that you can give to children out here. I've never quite managed to figure out how that's possible, but you can. And uh, yes, it, if you imagine it going rotten, that's what it would smell like. Of course, if you were to buy a bottle of the stuff, it would only go rotten in about 684 years. Uh, before that time, it would be perfectly, well, I mean, it would poison you to death eventually, but you could drink it uh, with the, an acceptable taste. Now, we've shown you the Black Widow spider before, and I've been trying to think how best to show it on television, and so at great risk to my personal self, my good self, I have managed to capture it in this small viewing box. This is the most venomous spider in all of Africa. And there you can see it, and I'm, I know this isn't the most amazing way to view it. I will clean the box out, sort of, uh, well, next time I use it, I'm going to release him back into his sort of web, or her into her web. But we can also look at her under the microscope. So let's do that now. I'll just turn around there. I mean, this isn't ideal, but of course I can't really put it on my hand because that will result in, a, well, a small visit, as I was saying to Fergus, to the Nelspreit Hospital fairly soon. And I don't really want to go there. Nelspreit's not a place you want to be on a Sunday. Any day, really. Okay, let's have a... I'm just going to wrap this in black paper so that we can work out the exposure properly. Yeah. There we go. I mean, look, it's not the best picture of this thing in the world. There we go. So that's, look at that. There's the hourglass shape. You can see it in glorious detail there. I'm just going to try and turn the light down slightly. 
There we go. And I'll go back to the spider now. There we are. Sorry. It's just a little difficult doing it like this. But there we are. You can see she's very much alive. Glorious detail there of her wonderful red hourglass. Oh, she's left. She's absconded. Uh, I keep getting a fright when she moves because I keep thinking to myself she must be about to escape, but she hasn't escaped. So what we're going to do is take her back outside and we're going to release her. She's getting a little bit upset in here and uh, the one thing we don't want is Africa's most venomous spider upset, I don't think. I would rather she was very happy. So what we're going to do now is uh, at great expense or great personal risk, Fergus, she's in. Phew. <laughs> onto her web and we'll just close her and give her some shade and cool. Thank you madam. Uh, please stay there for at least another week. Taylor has managed to refind her most favorite animals. Well, it's the animal that's definitely putting on the funniest show for us this afternoon. It's not the same warthogs we saw earlier. It is two different ones and of course you can see that that is a boy by his big tusks and the two warts on the side of his face because well warthogs have got two pairs of warts as you can see one close to the eye and one just above the tusks and I think he has a sow with him too but I'm not sure I haven't had a look at her yet but how great is this another big ball though he's not particularly small I think he's almost on the point uh, well, one of the larger warthogs I have seen in body size. If he were to charge you, you would definitely be pushed straight off of your feet. And they don't seem to mind us too much, just like the other warthogs you can see, also covered in mud. We're at three in a row pan now on Cheetah Plains. And I think that they're going to spend most of their afternoon around here, heads tucked down onto the grass and munching away with the occasional little mud bath when they get a bit hot. And they are so funny. You know what? This water kind of reminds me of David. And I'll tell and why I think that uh, and why I think that it looks a little bit like David, the other one, was because its mane was bleach blonde and we were commenting on David David's of course one of the cameramen, how his hair is looking so nice at the moment. It's been in the sun, it's blonder than normal. <laughs> After his harmonica lessons, we're now selling David off. I'm obviously, of course, just joking. Um, right, let me go forward a little bit. I want, what I want to do is I actually want to try and get in front of them so we don't have to look at their rear ends. Now, Tesla, who is six years old, my dear darling friend, who watches the safaris all the time. Hello. You were asking lots of questions about elephants yesterday, and today you're wondering how many piglets will mom have every single year. So they just give birth just once in the rainy season. Hi guys, are you going to stand still? I think they just may. Tesla's asking a question about you, so don't you dare run away. That would be very rude. And um, so, it, you know, it really just depends. I haven't seen a, a mom with more than about six piglets before, so normally it's around there. Unfortunately, most of them don't make it to adulthood, which is very, very sad, as you can imagine. But that's plenty. Uh, oh. And you can see, well, she's apparently salivating. Perhaps lunch has been that delicious. <laughs> she, maybe she's also got something in her mouth that she didn't quite like that was causing that. Now, Red Fire Queen, very great, uh, very good question from you this afternoon. Wondering if their tusks have nerves in them. Not at the top. So not at the tip of the tusk. It uh, most certainly won't. And often we see big warthog boars with chipped tusks from fighting. And um, so that won't hurt too much. However, as you start to go towards uh, well, where the skull is, I'm pretty sure that there'll be nerve endings at uh, the end of that. But whenever we find warthog skulls, of course, they've died. And normally the vultures and the hyenas and the carrion beetles and all those things have devoured it. So we don't get to see the nerves. It's almost like an elephant tusk, and I've spoken a bit about the, the nerves of, uh, at the end of an elephant's tusk, which I've unfortunately had the opportunity to see from an elephant that was poached in Zambia, and uh, I think it would be quite similar to that of a warthog. So it shouldn't hurt when it breaks off at the top, but I think it might be a little bit sore if they had to break it off where the nerves are. But how cool is this? Hello. You guys are very relaxed this afternoon. They're, obviously keeping their distance from us and I don't blame them 
normally uh, smaller prey species like for instance a warthog or even impala they don't normally get too comfortable around the cars they always keep their distance and of course uh, I don't I don't blame them for being a bit on the wary side I think we can be a bit scary with all the sounds that come from the vehicles and the strange well noises being our voices that also uh, can be heard but he's had a great day today. It doesn't look like he was recently in the mud. I think he'd been in a little bit earlier. It's all dried and started caking. And that's very good. That's what he wants. Because that will keep him nice and cool. But also it will start to suffocate any parasites that he's got on his body. He'll have loads and loads of ticks. A lot of them that we won't be able to see. They'll be so fine. But nonetheless, it will be doing the job that he needs done. And he's very clever. He's moving in the shade. He's not sitting out in the sun like uh, like Sebastian and I are. He's just feeding along the shady areas, and I think I'd be doing exactly the same thing if I was a warthog. Now, I'm trying to work out as well as we're watching the warthogs where they've been wallowing in the mud because you saw it quite easily with the warthogs that we spotted previously where they'd sort of made their little well where they were rolling around in but I don't see any of it around here so I wonder if it wasn't perhaps at the the third pan which is actually just a bit behind us oh actually I think maybe in that corner it might be a bit hard to see I think we might get the aerial and frame but just yes just in that corner over there where the tree is sort of uh, casting its beautiful reflection over the water it looks like there was something happening down over there. Maybe. Yeah, you see there's in the just in the right hand corner there's a little like a sort of footwell. Yeah, there we go. But who knows? There could have been something else that went down in there too. You never quite know. Our warthogs have now run away from us. Obviously they didn't like me talking about uh, their mud bath. Brent is of course still in Kenya and I'm sitting here envious with all the animals that he is seeing. But Brent, I hope you're having fun. Let's go get an update from him. Hello, hello! Um, well, we are very excited. We're exploring a completely new area. I have never been here. Neither has Eggsy. But we are coming down towards some of the main oh that's gonna be a bit bumpy sorry whoops okay we're through um we're going uh, down towards some of the main crossing points that the wildebeest are going to be using uh when they arrive from the serengeti oh hello buffaloes we got some dugger boys now again this area is probably quite a good one for for leopards just because there's a lot of these little thickets uh wooded areas uh, as we head down towards the river, lots of impala, lots of Thompson's gazelles, and uh, I'm even hoping we might find a Grant's gazelle in this area. I did see them near here a couple of days ago. And let's leave the Duggar boys to recline in the late afternoon sun. And uh, just probably about 100 meters ahead is the Mara River. Now, we're also going to be looking for some massive crocodiles in this area. There are some true, true giants that reside in the Mara. Well, hi, River. Uh, River is nine years old, and River is wondering if we see a, a bird called a cardinal here. Uh, and unfortunately not River. River's also got a nest in their garden. Uh, River, the, the cardinals, as far as I'm aware, is a, are a northern hemisphere species. I think in Americas, I'm not sure if they occur in Europe as well, but uh, it is possible. Now you see why this is such a good area for leopard. Look at this. So you've got these croton thickets and, uh, and right feeding up against the edge of the croton thickets, we've got impala. So if I was a leopard, this would be a really good spot. You could sneak really close uh, to the impala and, and leap out and grab one. Now that's the one. Leopard and cheetah are the two animals that have avoided us so far. Hey guys. Here we go. Better be on high alert close to the bush. Claire would like to know, what is my favorite new animal that I've seen so far? <gasps> That's so difficult. I think it's, it's probably got to be, I really love the gazelles. Uh, and um, it's a toss-up between the Grant's gazelle and a Thompson's gazelle. 
I think are, are just really cool. Now the Grand Gazelle is, is, is quite a bit bigger than a Tommy, but it's still got these massive horns. And, oh, I know. But we'll, we will try to definitely find them. Uh, they're a bit more common on the other side of the river, and we, we haven't got across there yet. We're just trying to sort of grapple with uh, the first 200,000 odd acres. But we have got a marabou stork. Now, once the migration comes, there's a lot of carcasses left in the river, and you get a lot of birds like marabous, and other scavengers will make, take full advantage of that. Here we go. He's having a, a, a little rest, a little lie down. We good? There we go. Marabou stalk. And you can see those very white legs. Of course, his, his legs aren't actually white. They're sort of a dark gray. But what happens is, uh, to help thermoregulate and to cool himself, he'll defecate on his legs. Oh, and we've got... Okay, we're about to get to a view of the river. I think there could be some hippos here. There could be some crocodiles. Oh, there's a guinea fowl running into frame there, Zander. So there we go. Helmeted guinea fowl. Uh, is the guinea fowl species we get around here. There are two other species in Kenya, but unfortunately they don't occur in the Mara, although we might get crested towards the escarpment. Okay, let's go look at the river. Hi, a Sophie. A Sophie is wondering whether we'll be doing bushwalks in the Mara. Uh, not, not for now, Sophie, and uh, definitely not down here. Uh, it is incredibly uh, sort of sated with buffalo and elephant and lion uh, it probably isn't a safe area to walk uh, particularly because you've got these very thick croton bushes and uh, it's not a good place you can get into lots of trouble now what is, what is up ahead here no thorough through oh no I don't think we can go through here we got to turn around here oh let's try find it there's a spot to view the river down here. Let me just move around. Oh, I think I might have taken <laughs> a wrong raid. Well, that's that's why we're here, learning where we can and can't go. Okay, well, we try to find you a view of the magnificent Mara River. Uh, let's go back to Commander Bond in his bush office. I want Brent and I want you to all encourage him very strongly to find a Grant's Gazelle because I didn't see one when I was there last time. I'm very jealous that he has managed to see one in just his first, well, he's been two days or three days in the field. So please tell him that I would also like to see a Grant's Gazelle very much. I have yet to see one. I think they'll probably be my favourite. And when you see the river, you will be truly, truly so amazed. I'm really looking forward to seeing it myself. Now, I think we're going to go, we're not going to go to the microscope. We're going to go to the air. There we are. We're just going to have a sort of scan over the landscape at the moment. And as I said in my beginning, the thing to notice here, of course, is that the landscape is changing. And that, of course, is an inevitable part of the passing of the seasons. And when it was oh, just a month ago, that was a completely green view. The sky tended to be a lot deeper blue than it is now. And we're now getting that slightly washed out effect that the winter skies or the winter sun gives us. And we're definitely seeing a change from the verdant emeralds and greens to just a slightly more subtle colours of yellowy green. And eventually, of course, when June and July comes, that beautiful brown, copper and gold and grey will mix together to form a landscape that, if you're not used to, can, well, it can look a little bit harsh to some people, but to those of us who've grown up here, the winter landscape is very beautiful indeed, and it's just a sort of, um, it's just a different, it's a different kind of beauty to the obvious fertility of the green summer. I think that's beautiful. Now, I have something at a very small scale here. As I've mentioned many times before, of course, we have the flower that keeps on giving. There it is, Fergus, pay homage. Good. This is, of course, Waltheria indica. And it never stops giving. And today is no exception. Please look under the microscope. Now, I don't know what this is. 
It looks like a little fish moth, uh, mixed in with its ship timber beetle, shrunken down to a miniature size, and there are lots of them in here. And I think that they are either tending or eating aphids. I saw an aphid as well. And the aphid is a sort of yellowy green color, the same as the plant. And you sudden, sometimes you just see them scuttling along the flowers. There's one. Uh, oh, I can't point. Um, top left, top left hand side, you'll just see a little green yellow colored thing scampering about. Can you see it there? It's almost invisible. It is the most perfect color. Now it has disappeared. That was wonderful. Okay, well, some of you would have seen it. That's an aphid of some sort. That's an arachnid. Not an arachnid at all, sorry. Can you see it at the top? You can see it at the top. Yes, there it is. Oh, there are a few of them. Now, these other insects may be tending the aphids. There's an, there, in fact, there are quite a few of them coming out now. Or they're eating them. Or they're eating those little sort of bubbles. Now, I don't know if you can see, on, they're little stalks with what look like little balls on the end of them. Most of them have been cleared of their little balls. And those little balls, I suspect, are quite sweet. And maybe this insect, whatever it is, is helping in the pollination of Waltheria indica, the plant that never stops giving. And there was also an ant crawling around here frantically. And I suspect the ant was tending the aphids. And the aphids produce, of course, a honeysuckle. And the ants will then take that honeysuckle and in turn protect them from predators. There, now look at this thing coming out on the left hand side there. And let's see if we can't see what it's trying to eat. It looks like it's stuck. It looks a bit like me trying to get out of the tree earlier today. You see what I mean? What an odd shape it is. It's so amazing. Move it slightly. And then it burrows down again. Why it should have such a long tail? Especially when it lives in a plant like this, I don't know. So any ideas as to what it is, hashtag Safari Live, let us know. I think it's just fantastic. Disappearing down into each flower, what it's eating. I mean, this is a micro ecosystem in front of us here on a piece of plant no more than half an inch across. Got aphids, ants, these funny little ship timber beetle type things. I'm just going to change quickly the focus. No. Okay, so that's gorgeous. We'll see what else we can find on this plant and see if we can't find one or two other things. Uh, while we do that, I believe that Byron is... Which th I don't know if he's still with it. No, he's not. He is uh, still thinking about taking his bath. <laughs> I'm not going to take a bath yet, James. This water doesn't look too clean. But uh, we left out that beautiful elephant and what a great sighting. That was so, so exciting. Very, very nice to spend time with that big bull. He eventually just moved off and we walked in the opposite direction. So it was lovely to see him. But Jandre spotted something all the way in the distance over here. Oh, follow me. Let's hope it's still there. It may have run away. Jandre, it is running away. <laughs> We're going to have to hurry up here quickly. Don't go in there. Don't go in there. <laughs> wow, look at this. Look at this big leopard tortoise over here. That's amazing. That's very, very cool. Oh, look at that huge leopard tortoise. Look how big he is. And you can see this leopard tortoise has actually been in the wars a little bit. I'm not sure, maybe some scars from animals trying to, trying to uh, um, possibly bite him, break his shell, break his carapace. There he was, he's just moving straight into the long grass. You can see there's some cracks on the shell. I don't want to disturb him, I don't want to pull him out. There's no reason for that. We've had a nice view of him, and, but that is a huge, huge leopard tortoise. So well spotted, Jandre. Um, and he walked quite quickly, covered quite a bit of distance while it, or for the time it took for us to get here. And he's probably going to rest in this thicket for the night. But a leopard tortoise like that, I'm sure he's got amazing stories to tell. He's probably, and I don't know exactly, but I, I would say he's between 30 and 50 years old. I would guess a leopard tortoise, tortoise this size, especially out here. That's very, very big for a leopard tortoise. 
and I do think he's most likely around there. Very, very big old leopard tortoise. And as I said, all the scarring, the parts of the carapace that are peeling off, that have broken off, off the shell. So uh, very, very interesting to know what has happened to this tortoise. There you can see there too, just like some scars, part of the shell peeling off, breaking off. At the back here too, that little section's loose. But beautiful, look at the patterns on this. Really amazing. This is wonderful. A nice, nice sighting. We've had so much fun on this bushwalk this afternoon. Chameleons, we saw that elephant, we saw that tiny little thread snake, which I haven't seen before. A big leopard tortoise. This is what a bushwalk is all about. Sometimes it can be quiet and you don't see too much, but every now and then you have a bit of luck and you spot these tiny creatures, which is what we're looking for on a walk. Um, not just the tiny ones, the big elephant too, just to get the, the adrenaline going a little bit. Um, Herbert and Jandre almost ran away earlier when they saw the elephant. <laughs> not quite, not quite. Now we're going to try and have a look around here. We saw tracks of the leopards from this morning. Um, heading into this, uh, into this area, I was hoping we might have seen some of them, or one of them, at least one of them, around this waterhole, possibly drinking. But there are some other little pans up ahead. We're going to stick to our plan and head towards that area, have a look around there. But the bush is so thick at the moment. If they are hiding in these blocks, it would be very difficult for us to find them. But we're hoping that because of the heat, they've decided to head to some water. So we'll try our luck. I'm going to head through here. Head back out that direction and towards that other water hole. See if there's anything else interesting around here. Okay, well, while we search, there's just a beautiful big grasshopper. Look at this. Now, we had one of these jump onto the vehicle. Now, Brent is waiting for us. We'll link to him shortly. But look at this beautiful, beautiful grasshopper. There it goes. <laughs> All right, well, Brent's on search for hyena in the Mara. Let's go have a look how that's going. Hello, hello. Okay, well, you can just see. Let me just stop for a second. There we go. The Mara River up ahead. So we're heading down towards the river to the main crossing areas where the wildebeest cross. And this is where James and, and Graham were filming last year. Uh, when they got some incredible sequences. Now also there's a hyena den somewhere around here. We're not sure exactly where yet, so that's the fun part. We're searching. And this is also the area where I did see some Thompson's gazelle. And also, I'm sure a lot of you are excited. Although he hasn't been seen in a while. This is Scar's territory. So below this ridge here, all the way down to the river. Prime territory. But uh, we are, from chatting to the other guides and that, it doesn't look like he's been seen in, in, a, in, a, in a month or maybe even a bit longer. And it's difficult. We never know with male lions, and especially older male lions, they disappear. Sometimes they just appear again. Uh, we've got some giraffe and some gazelles down at the bottom there. So let's get a bit closer. Hopefully there's a, a Grant's gazelle there. Now, James is wondering, are our chances of seeing Art Fark higher in the Mara than in Juma? I would say yes, James. Uh, specifically, when we, we get all our vehicles set up for the, the nocturnal stuff, we're going to have a very good chance spending many hours out at night. And there are lots of termite mounds, and there, there are quite a lot of Art Fark in this area, so I think we've got a very good chance. Uh, also, things like Art Wolf, Caracal, Serval. Uh, lots of the little nocturnal creatures we're going to have a very good chance of seeing once our, our, our nighttime kit is all sorted and set up. Ooh, there's lots of animals there. And there's a, a big herd. I can't see exactly what's in, but there's a, quite a lot of, I'm guessing, gazelles, impala, maybe a topi or three. There's some triple skirchies coming up, the, the giraffe, and some definitely some tommies. Oh, that's a lovely big herd. It's so exciting. Oh, wow. And there must be close to over a hundred animals in that little clearing down there. 
Now this is the exact spot where I saw the Grant's gazelles a few days ago. Maybe the Grant's gazelle are in that big herd. So, but Okay, well we've got a bit of a traffic jam here. And we've got some triple skirchies in the road. Uh, I know James was hoping for Grant's gazelle. Me too, James. And we got and um, triple skirchies of course are the Maasai giraffe. And it looks like two boys. Now Norm is wondering if you can off-road here. Norm, you can. So uh, the general rule is you don't off-road down towards the river, but you can off-road away from the river. So you must remember that there are lots of vehicles here, especially during the high season. So too many vehicles off-roading on sensitive soil is not a good thing. Uh, so no one off-roads to the right, but to the left we can off-road. Well, thank you for moving on, Triple Skirchies. Magnificent creatures. I do love the patterns. Whoop! They're going to head off, and I think... Let's try get a bit closer to that really big herd, and I think there were some more giraffe with them. And I think we're going to see some big crocodiles as well. They're going to make Boris look like uh, like a like a puddle frog. Okay, now, where are you Grant's gazelles? Are you hiding amongst the Tommies and Impalas? Okay, here we go. Let's look carefully. Let's go, here we go. Tell me when to stop when it's good for you, eggs. Good? Alas! I don't see any Grant's gazelle. I only see Impala and Tommy's. No. I know we spoke about the Thompson's gazelle on the Sunrise Safari and uh, where it got its name. A few of you might have missed it. So it's from an explorer called Joseph Thompson. And he was Scottish, he was a Scottish geologist, and he was quite unique in the fact that he was one of the few explorers of the sort of Victorian era that did not have troubles with his porters and the local people. And he had the most incredible motto, uh, those who, he who travels gently travels safely, he who travels safely travels far, which is just awesome. Okay, we can hear some hippos. I'm just going to ask Doug, where do you think is the best place to see crocodiles? This one or the next one? The next one. The next one. Okay, so we're going to keep moving towards uh, one of the crossing points where we're going to hopefully see some big crocs and I'm hoping there's going to be a Grant's gazelle on the way. Now, in these big open plains, your binoculars are very important, but also one of the best animals to keep an eye on is giraffe because they can spot things spot things in the long grasses now Tony says hopefully uh, we'll find some cheetah uh, I definitely am gonna go into the area where the, the cheetah are more common uh, at some point in the next little while but um, at the moment the cheetah stay away from this area because of the high density of lions they're further to the south uh, on the boundary of Kenya and Tanzania so we, we will we will be going down there when we do get a chance but uh, at the moment, we're just really focusing on trying to figure out this area. And I mean, it is just so big. Uh, it's, it's so exciting. I don't know where I'm going to go next. But I know we haven't actually had a good proper look at the river. So we're going to get down to the river. But just before we do that, there's some lapwings. Which lapwings are these? Oh, I'm not sure which lapwings these are. Lapwings, lapwings, lapwings. What do you think they are, eggs? Lapwings. They're lapwings. Yeah. Is that all you've got to offer? Yeah. So, of course, there's quite a lot of crossing over of species, so you just got to be sure. 
Um, now, there is a very cool lapwing that I am excited to show you. Yes, I was just making sure that it is who I thought it was, and just in case I got caught out. It is a crowned lapwing. <laughs> uh, I thought there might be a different species. Okay, so we're going to head down towards the river now, and uh, while we do that, let's go across to Commander Bond and an arachnid. Yes, there is indeed an arachnid here, everybody, and it is a very small arachnid, only about two millimeters in length, in fact, probably maybe even one and a half millimeters, which of course is about a twentieth of an inch. Now, that is very tiny, and Fergus is doing an exceptional job of filming it. It's an orbweb spider, a tiny, tiny orbweb spider that has suspended itself, suspended itself, in between two Natal Gwari bushes. And I don't, further than that, I cannot tell you what it is, but it's really rather a special little chap. Isn't that cool? Then, I've just spotted something over here, Fergus. I, well, you stay there. I'll turn it so that you can see it. In fact, yes, well, I'll try. I don't want to pull it off because I think it probably uh, sort of depends on the fact that the tree is living there. Now those must be the eggs of some kind of creature here. I suspect a caterpillar of some sort. I mean, they are going to be caterpillars, but I suspect a butterfly has laid those there. And I don't see a huge number of butterfly larvae or moth larvae or caterpillars on quarry bushes, so I'm not sure what species it will be. But each of these things is starting to deposit their, le their eggs now. And if you're going to deposit your eggs on a leaf, then you'd best make sure that the plant that you deposit them on at this stage of the game is uh, not deciduous but evergreen, which of course all of the gwari bushes are. And so they should survive even if they don't hatch before next summer. So that's quite fun there. What else can we find on this gwari bush? It is important, of course, to understand that this is not the most common gwari bush. And as my mother was saying to me today, she said uh, on my weekly phone call to her, she said, you know, raspberries are in season at the moment, which of course they are. And uh, the gwari bushes are about to come into season with their fruit as well. It will be very exciting. Now over here, Fergus, we have our very old pal, Polyrachis. You see Polyrachis there? You can't, can you? There she is. Now Polly Rakers, for those of you who don't know and haven't seen her before, is identified by the sort of fork-like structure between her abdomen and her thorax. And I'm not sure what it's for, because I don't imagine it's very good for defense. And she'll be looking for aphids and uh, scale insects and those sorts of things to tend for their honeydew and then take them back to the web. She's magnificent, especially in the golden light. Right, we are now going to go off for a short break, everybody, but please do not go anywhere. With any luck, Taylor will come up with a leopard or two, and Byron will bump into something else on foot. I'm trying to think of something to advertise. Can't. Not fast enough. It's Sunday. Anyway, thank you for bearing with us during these rehearsals, as I say to you every day, because, of course, we do have to rehearse, otherwise we'll make a big mess of things. OK, I think we're going to go back into our tent now. We haven't found anything further out here. Fergus has got himself attached to the bush. Let us carry on. And hopefully we will soon be almost in the Mara River, and, in fact, that is precisely where we are going now. Well, here we are, we've made it to the edge of the Mara River. And there we go, you can see oh, how many? One, two, three, four large crocodiles. And I'm not looking anywhere else, just on that sort of one bank. Now, the biggest of them, who's a true giant, is the one sort of who's half out of the water. You've got him, eggs on the right. That's the big, 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 big boy. And they really don't feed much apart from their, their feast when the wildebeest cross. Oh, look, 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 look at that. Oh, sorry, eggs. There's a hippo rolling in the rapids above. 
He's going completely upside down and doing a roly roly poly. He's stopped now, of course, because I spotted him. <laughs> so, yeah, we're right on the edge of the Mar River, and this is one of the main crossing points. Now, eggs towards the left, you see, you can see where the wildebeest will be running down, and this is the main area they're going to cross. And of course, these crocodiles are, are quite territorial over the good spots, and they'll be waiting. Ooh, mm, oh, 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 love that sound. So you can see this area of the river, it doesn't have that big thick forest like further to the north. And that's one of the reasons why the wildebeest cross here. Now I think this is actually, no, it's the next crossing where James got the, the lion kill. Oh, isn't this just spectacular? So the water, the river is actually quite low for this time of the year. And uh, it has risen a bit since we've actually been here. But I'm sure the crocodiles won't mind. There's some hippos right in front of us here, in front of the crocodiles. Now, I don't think there's enough money you could pay me to try swim the Mara River. <laughs> it's not worth it. There are a lot of hippos and a lot of crocodiles. Now Cedar Point is wondering how deep is the water. Well, I'm not going to go test, that's for sure. But I'm probably guessing at the deepest in the deep pools, it's probably three or four meters. But on average, probably uh, around two meters in, 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 in the middle. Uh, maybe a bit shallower, uh, and, I, and it'll change throughout the year as, as the water level changes with the rains. Oh, there's someone doing some fishing. And when you get him there. Here we go. You get him. The yellow-billed stork for the birders, for the bird list. Doing some fishing in the Mara River. I'd say there's probably tilapia. Uh, catfish, barbs, catlets uh, are the fish species that are, you're going to find in the Mara River. And it's always quite dirty. It doesn't really get clean. Never gets clean. There we go. So it's always quite dirty. So lots of silt uh, and whatnot from the, the, the runoff. But that, that's very common with a, a young river system like this where the banks are comp always folding in on themselves. Now, I've got another surprise just up at the drag that I spotted on my way down to the river. And I think there are going to be a few happy campers. Okay. Ooh, I wonder what it is. I wonder what it is. Let's go find out. Suspense. Eggsy knows what it is. Doug knows what it is. Brent knows what it is. Hi, as Shelley. Uh, Shelley's wondering, are the best sightings from a hot air balloon? Well, Shelley, you, you, we had some incredible sightings from the hot air balloon, but I would say from a, a pure safari and actual watching the animals in interaction. It is still from a vehicle, that, and, and that's nothing to take away from the, the balloon experience, which is <gasps> breathtaking. Uh, but the thing is, with the prevailing winds, uh, the balloon can't really hover in one spot for too long. And so you, you quite often, like when we saw the lions hunting from the balloon, we just sort of woo over the top of them, uh, and then we were quite far. Now, don't tell me they've done a disappearing act. No, they couldn't have. No, it's right here. And they were right, right here. I'm sure we'll find them again now. Eggsy says, why is that Impala so white? Is when we drove past a little bit earlier. And of course, it was not a white Impala at all. Where have they gone? Okay, they must be here in the long grass. We'll find them now. Who can spot the white Impala? Oh, where are we looking? Oh, they're just over there. Okay, I've got them now. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Eggs. So, we are 
30 seconds away. This is just the most magnificent ecosystem to be able to, it's, it's just an incredible privilege to be able to, to take you guys on a safari here. It is, it is mind-bogglingly beautiful and, and amazing. There we go. Come here, White Impala. Let's just get on the right side of the light. It's so cool. See the mix? Yeah. Here we go. Now we can actually compare uh, the the two gazelle species. Good. There we go. There is the Grants, and that's what he thinks of us. And Grants gazelle. And uh, Tommy's around him as well. Now. We haven't ever seen sort of big groups of grants. They seem to be in smaller little herds. Uh, James says he's very happy to see the grants gazelle. Yeah, and that looks like a, is that a female or male? It's a male. Now, he, I've seen grants with absolutely mass. Oh, there's a female further on. Massive horns. And he doesn't have the biggest set of horns. But you can see much paler uh, than, than, than the Tommies. And there are quite a lot of Tommies. There's a very productive area around here. For, for lots of different things. But there's uh, all, oh, there's, oh, what are the Tommies running from at the bottom? I think they just got a fright. Oh, hang on. No, that's just some grass. And there's a, an elephant bull. And you got him there, eggs. And it looked like, he, there we go. Now he's actually on the other side of the river from us at the moment. Oh, those grants are pretty. Oh, well, from a big, great grey beast across the Mara River to looking at one from above. I'm really quite excited by that uh, Grant's Gazelle. It's my first one ever, so that's great. Sharing it with you, the experiences of the Mara. Now, that's a gorgeous picture of the sun going down, and we're about to get a better one from the air. Now, that is a magnificent elephant bull. Good grief. Connor T has outdone himself. He's got the framing absolutely perfect. 